Good afternoon, everyone. Are we ready? Terrific. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councilman Rory Lantzman, Chair of the Courts and Legal Services Committee, and welcome to this hearing on the operations of the Criminal Domestic Violence and Integrated Domestic Violence Courts in New York City. In recent years, domestic violence has remained stubbornly immune to, to this city's generally falling crime rates. In fact, domestic violence offenses have risen both in total number and as a percentage of all crime in the city. We have thankfully moved beyond the time when domestic violence was considered just a private family matter. We now realize that every act of domestic violence ripples out to affect our city. It leads to homelessness, health problems and hospital visits, police interventions, lost jobs or missed time, not to mention its effect on children's well-being and education. Indeed, domestic violence recently surpassed evictions as the leading cause of homelessness in the city, now accounting for 30% of the families with children who find themselves in the shelter system. In 2016, the NYPD responded to over 91,000 intimate partner-related domestic violence calls, up 22.6% from the previous year. There were also 63 family-related homicides. 38 of those were intimate partner homicides, up 46% from 26 homicides in 2015, <clears throat> and representing 11% of all homicides in New York City last year. A 2013 survey found 58% of survivors reported taking time off from work, and 28% said they had lost a job as a result of domestic violence. Domestic violence also profoundly impacts our court system. More and more, courts have realized that a domestic violence assault is different than a typical assault that might lead to the same charges. Family ties, power dynamics, and financial dependence may all come into play. An intimate partner relationship may be longstanding or have children in common. Since the 1990s, New York courts have been at the forefront of the movement to create specialty courts to handle these delicate cases. One innovation has been the creation and spread of New York's Integrated Domestic Violence, or IDV courts, which now operate in every borough. With a one-family, one-judge model, these courts allow a single judge to hear multiple cases involving the same family, including not only criminal, but custody, visitation, civil protection, and divorce when the underlying issue is domestic violence. These courts treat the whole family, but they also expose other areas where we, where we are perhaps not as holistic in our approach. We must ensure that services available to victims and families are uniformly excellent and comprehensive at every level of the justice system that deals with domestic violence. Questions have been raised about whether families involved with felony DV cases are being provided with the appropriate level of services or whether more resources go to those charged with lesser offenses. Services must be robust enough to meet every family's requirements and be available to all who need them. Many of these families will continue in one form or another long after the justice system leaves their lives. We must ensure that all families impacted by domestic violence have been given the tools and provided with the services to enable them to move forward safely. The court system provides an opportunity to connect victims and families with those resources. We look to forward to hearing from an IDV court judge, legal services organizations, court services providers, advocacy organizations, and others about what they are seeing in our DV and IDV courts and what steps the city and other governmental actors can take to improve outcomes. Um, with that, let me uh, acknowledge we've been joined by Council Member Barry Grudenchik from Queens, who is a member. Well, you're making yourself very comfortable there, sir. Um, and let us start with our first witness. Judge, if you'd raise your right hand. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Please state your name for the record, and uh, we're very, very happy to have you here. All right. My name is Judge Esther Morgenstern, and I preside over the IDV court in Kings County. I want to first thank uh, Councilman Lanceman for inviting me here to uh, share my experience in the IDV court with the Committee on Courts and Legal Services. I also want to commend his Chief of Staff. She was wonderful in arranging this for me. 
The IDV court in Kings County is a model court. We are also a mentor court. We have received the Department of Justice uh, award and we've received grants from the Justice Department because we have developed the best practices in terms of dealing with domestic violence. We have had visitors from the country, around the country, come see our part, as well as internationally. They've come from as far as Japan, Australia, and I traveled to Korea recently to speak about domestic violence. I want to just give you a little history. You mentioned 1990s. I was elected in 1995, and they sent me from civil court immediately to criminal court. And in 1997, they opened the misdemeanor domestic violence court. At the time, in New York, in Brooklyn, we arraigned 100,000 defendants. 10% of those were domestic violence cases. A third of those 10% were stamped with subject to the family court's orders of visitation. I never knew what happened in family court because our volume was so high, we had no time to speak to family court. Fast forward six years, I was uh, given an acting Supreme Court justice position, sent to family court. Here I am seeing the same people that I had seen in criminal court, and I asked, how's the uh, criminal case going? and I had access to the domestic violence registry, so I knew there was a criminal case. Again, I got no information. At the time, former Chief Judge Kay realized this was an untenable place to be because we never knew what was going on, and so by administrative order, she created problem-solving courts and started with the IDV court. It was established to provide one family, one judge, as you indicated, it was a problem-solving court which delivers a more comprehensive judicial solution than if the litigants were forced to go from court to court hearing different judges decide the same issue with different results. At the time, Judge Kay told me that she had heard about a case that litigated for five years with 14 cases before seven judges in four courts, Supreme Court, Family Court, Criminal Court, Housing Court. It was impossible. IDV simplifies that. We bring the intimate partner uh, domestic violence, criminal cases before the court. We issue consistent orders. We're very concerned about increasing victim safety, eliminating multiple court appearances, coordinating information, and making informed decisions. The biggest advantage is shorter adjourn dates. Once the defendant is arrested for a criminal domestic violence case in Brooklyn, that's the jurisdiction. If there's a family case pending, a visitation, custody, a family offense where there's concurrent jurisdiction, we transfer all the cases to IDV. Once the matrimonial is filed, we bring that right to IDV as well. It cuts down on the number of supplemental petitions because they know they're going to come right back and see me again. So it's once in IDV, always in IDV, and so the numbers are cut down. It, before we started the part, we, to establish the protocol, which I've given you a copy of, Councilman, and if they want additional copies, they're available, we held many stakeholder meetings. With the different stakeholders expressed their position, we had the Center for Court Innovation, Safe Horizon, of course the Mayor's Office, the DA's Office, Brooklyn Defenders, Legal Aid, the New York Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, CFS, the 18B lawyers who we cross-trained down the road to handle both criminal and family petitions. We had the Children's Law Center represented, probation, the police department, NYCHA housing, and we even included the clergy because we wanted to get their position and how they can help us in this new adventure. Also at the time, we were provided with a lot of resources, so we have one dedicated sergeant, three officers, always the same. They don't rotate out of the part. We have a resource coordinator. Some of the agencies, Safe Horizon, have social workers assigned to us in the courtroom. And um, access to the um, Justice Center is really important for us, so we if we, our resource coordinator notices there's someone who doesn't have representation or needs additional information in terms of immigration, housing, et cetera, we have access to the Justice Center. The statewide coordinating judge for family violence, Judge Kaplan, has provided support to our mentor court and continues to provide training throughout the state. Now, if you want to compare this to the DV court, Again, it's just stamping those orders where the judge has no idea of what's going on. Family court with a limited jurisdiction. Um, we combine all of those cases, including the um, matrimonials, which once they're in our part, we deal with child support because if the party's never married or if they haven't filed their matrimonial yet, the support matter stays with the support magistrate, and that's difficult as well. It forces the litigants to run to another part. Um, our vision, again, is to deal with the one family, one judge unit. When I started 
with the model part. I started in Queens because they wanted to start the model part in a smaller jurisdiction. I sat there for three years. And we were able to do the juvenile delinquency cases, the abuse and neglect cases as well, housing court. Brooklyn is just a much bigger jurisdiction, and so we're unable to bring those other cases in. Um, some of the obstacles and challenges, I just wanted to mention those, the confidentiality issues. We create one family file, but in that file it has the family petitions, the criminal cases, and the divorce. They don't just get merged together. If the defendant seeks a trial, it goes back to square one. The criminal defense attorney is not entitled to the uh, mental health forensic evaluation from the family court file. And likewise, the family court attorneys are not entitled to the uh, rap sheets necessarily. They may have to subpoena some of those records. Uh, of course, with our cross-trained attorneys and with our wonderful attorneys from BDS and Legal Aid, they're representing on all sides. So obviously, they have access to all the information. But um, it's just not open to everybody to have all the paperwork. It's, we look at those um, very clearly and keep them separate. Another thing that concerned me at first, and I'm still concerned about it, is not allowing the attorneys to bargain away safety or custody uh, to have the complaining witness not cooperate with the DA in the prosecution. So we're aware that that goes on. No one comes to the bench and says, I have a global solution, and you know she's not going to testify in the criminal case if she gets this or that. So we, we do look at that. Uh, we have a lot of services that we offer in IDV. We have the resource coordinator who's the link to the services on the court. ACS provides preventive services, drug and alcohol treatment, batter intervention programs, supervised visitation with trauma counseling for the victim as well as the children, and parent education for the non-custodial parents. Um, parenting skills. We also have access, because we are in the criminal uh, building Supreme Court, access to the Veterans Court and the Mental Health Court which occasionally we're forced to send cases there when there are mental health issues that our part cannot deal with. Um, also, we have the ability to order drug tests and um, do warrant checks and SORA, sex offender registration um, checks before we issue orders of protection. So if the defendant or respondent is living with somebody new and we're sending ACS out to the home, we want an SCR clearance on that person before we send that child out to that home. Um, again, in the consolidation, we also bring in our paternity cases, and we also are the compliance part, and that is if a defendant takes a plea or is found guilty after trial and we send them to drug treatment, alcohol, probation, they come back to court and again are seen by the court. Um, if they're rearrested for drugs or alcohol, driving while intoxicated, I'll transfer those cases in as well while I'm monitoring the visitation and custody. Um, once we get to the matrimonials, if we're doing a, a trial on the um, matrimonial case, we do business evaluations, a home appraisals. It's a regular matrimonial trial, which can take a long time when we're talking about um, more money parties. I find that IDV criminal cases are disposed of more quickly because the victim is always in the courtroom for her visitation case or the custody case or the matrimonial. And um, I find all of our cases resolved more quickly. Our biggest challenge is supervised visitation because we do um, have the Legal Aid Society defenders, 18B representing criminal defendants. We also assign the cross-trained attorneys on the um, visitation portion and the batter intervention programs the criminal defendants need to pay for. But when it comes to supervised visitation, there's a real lacking of services for that. And when you're at the end of the case with two years have gone by, the criminal cases have resolved and uh, matrimonial has resolved, the children, we still want them to reconnect with the non-custodial parent. And very often I sign 722C orders, which allows the court to use you know, city and state funds to, uh, to have those visitations occur. But there's real needed, a real need for additional funds for supervised visitation. I hope the council can see maybe to give us a grant for that. That would be something that would really be in addition to our part. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much. Um, that's a good overview. I know I've got a bunch of questions. Let me just mention that we've been joined by council members Carlos Menchaca from Brooklyn and Paul Vallone from Queens. Um, so let's let's get right into it. Just, can you just distinguish for the council member and layperson alike the difference between the, the, the integrated domestic violence courts or parts and the regular plain vanilla DV part? The DV part is only a criminal misdemeanor 
Say it again. Court. It is a criminal misdemeanor court. So the, D, the, the, the regular DV part is just criminal court misdemeanors. Correct, and it remains there. We take, in addition to everything else I said, when there's a violation of an order of protection and it rises to a felony, we bring those felonies in as well. As a Supreme Court justice, I can hear criminal. When you say we, you mean the IDV? IDV, yes. Okay, so the IDV hears felonies? Correct. And also certain qualifying misdemeanors? No, most of our docket is misdemeanor docket. We transfer the cases from the criminal lower court to our part when we see there's a match in family court or someone's filed for divorce. Okay, so, so once these that are, match is made... So, so the, the underlying criminal charges in the IDV court, which is a Supreme Court part, right? Correct. Are misdemeanor cases. Correct. But they're being heard at Supreme Court. Correct. Um, the DV parts, which are also misdemeanor cases by, by definition, they're in criminal court. Why are those cases not being being also transferred to IDV? What what because what makes the, a case ineligible for an IDV part? At the time there is no open visitation, custody, or family offense petition, and there is no open matrimonial. You have to have a match to get into the part. And so does there need to be an open family or matrimonial or just there's a family or matrimonial issue that should be resolved. It's got to be a bona fide existing Correct. case. The idea is one family, one judge. So the protocol which we set up, if a case has been before a family court judge for two years and there's forensic evaluations already done and they're set for trial, even though there's a new criminal arrest, I won't transfer that in. Now, I'm it. one family, one judge, new cases that I can make a difference in the family. Got it. Now the cases that you're hearing, which are your Supreme Court judge, so you're hearing it in Supreme Court, are they... Are the, just so I understand, are they all misdemeanor cases? Are felony DV cases eligible for the IDV felony part? Oh, or the we, IDV court, IDV which is court. in Supreme Court? We have a felony DV judge, Judge Matt Demick, runs the felony DV part, so the uh, more serious felonies go directly to Judge Demick. While in my case, if I have several misdemeanors pending and suddenly they indict the defendant, that stays with me. If there's a criminal contempt that goes to AP1 and they're waiting for uh, the grand jury to act and it's my case that I've been sitting on, I can transfer them in. None, none of the judges or my colleagues are going to say, don't take my case. They're happy to have it come my way. If I want the case, I can transfer it in. It, I'm looking for the right. family to make right. a difference. If, if someone is charged with a felony and it's a DV animating, uh, you know, there's a DV issue that, that is at the root of it, but they're charged with a felony because of the seriousness of what they did. Are they ineligible, f and is the family ineligible for the IDV court? Yes. In other words, Judge Demick is uh, presiding over the felony domestic violence court, and generally if there are major, major injuries, we're not up to visitation and custody. So let me ask you. Defendant's incarcerated at the time, and so he's not visiting. If they file for divorce, of course, the divorce is going to be heard, but it's not coming to my part with a violent felony pending. Right. So, so one of the things that we heard, and now I'm understanding what is being said when I, when I, when I heard this, is that it seems, it seems odd that the more serious the case, the less likely the victim, and I'm going to say, I'm going to go out on a limb and say 98% of the time it's a woman. 90%. 90. Okay. All right. It's a woman, is, does not get the benefit of being an integrated domestic violence court with, with one judge, one, one case. What, that seems to not make, make sense. The issues are a little different. Generally, bail is set on the uh, felony cases. Judge Demick is monitoring them in a different way. He may have assigned a probation officer or some officer to watch the defendant. Um, the overriding issue is safety for the victims in those cases. Um, but how would their safety be undermined if instead of being in front of Judge Demick, they were in front of you, and you at that same time were hearing whatever family court or matrimonial court case was also pending. All right, so the issue is visitation and custody. At that point, I don't think the criminal defendant who's charged with a violent felony is a candidate for custody, so that's not really being litigated. The concurrent jurisdiction part on the family offense petitions, Judge Demick is issuing orders of protection Clearly, and so I don't know if they're going forward on those um, O dockets once it's a violent felony. And in terms of the matrimonial, I haven't seen that many mats with violent felony 
DV pending. But I'm going to look at this issue because I haven't really thought that deeply about I, it. I, I think, but I'm not certain that when we do hear from the legal services providers, they will raise the issue of why can't victims, nine out of ten of whom are women, can't get the benefit of one judge, one one case, if if the the DV that they're a victim of is is even more serious. Right. Um, which courts, I think I know the answer, but I want to make it clear. So, so a DV victim might have cases pending in lots of different places because of the situation he or she is in. And I think you mentioned earlier when you were in Queens, maybe, there were lots of different kinds of cases, housing, et cetera. So, so which court will be consolidated, which cases will be consolidated before, before, before you? Only uh, matrimonial and, and, and family court? Family court, visitation, custody, family offense petitions, and paternity. Those are the transfers that I do on family court. The matrimonial cases, child support once they file the mat, otherwise child support has to remain with a designated magistrate. Uh -huh. And that's federal because for every dollar they collect, the, the the federal government gives two dollars, so that remains with the magistrate. Um, in Queens, I was able to do the housing court issues. In other words, he comes in and says it's his lease, he wants to evict her. Right now, I have the ability, and I do occasionally call housing court and stay the eviction, pending the outcome of my case, but it would be better if it was before me. Mm -hmm. And the abuse and neglect. When I was in Queens, I was able to do that. It's a different arm of ACS that deals with abuse and neglect cases. And it takes a really long time, and it's, it's just much more complicated. And we just have too many cases in my part. I currently have about 700 petitions between criminal family and the divorces. And um, juvenile delinquency from those same families would make sense if I could bring that in, because the yeah. parties are before me, their children are acting up or being charged with you know, a juvenile delinquent is, act. There's is just, it just a ma matter of, of volume? Because it, it seems to me it would be, if it's good to have certain, you know, family court and matrimonial issues resolved by the same judge, it would be even better to have the housing court and, and, and whatever other, you know, things are being adjudicated in, in these folks' lives. Is it just a matter of your volume would volume. then triple and, and... I don't know and, if it would triple, but it would get much right. larger. It's, it's, right. it's a big volume of case. Housing court, plenty of those cases but come But there's up. no... There's, There's no reason why I can't. Our uh, jurisdiction was upheld. It was up to the Court of Appeals. Mm -hmm. They challenged IDV. I'm an, a Supreme Court justice, but the, I was not supposed to hear misdemeanors as a justice. I was right. only supposed to. So that was challenged, and that went up. I can transfer basically into my part what I want to transfer in. There's no um, ju jurisdictional bar to it, other than, of course, criminal cases that are committed outside of Brooklyn. Right. And how do you deal, like this committee has her, had hearings on, on other specialty courts like the veterans courts or mental health courts or drug courts, et cetera. What do you do when the, um, the domestic violence defendant might be eligible for veterans court or, or some other court? Do you then perform the same function as the veterans court would? Or? No, we've had several cases that were sent to the um, mental health court where the parties, the... Uh, defendant was really in need of real mental health services. We do have access to those programs, but there's a certain level of monitoring that the, vet, that the mental health court does. So we've taken advantage of using them. Um, with the Veterans Court, uh, we've sent several criminal defendants to the Veterans Court. Uh, my concern with that is when a uh, defendant takes a plea in Veterans Court and admits to his guilt, and then fast forward a year and a half later and we're trying the custody portion, and he gets on the stand and denies it. So I had one of those um, experiences, and that really turned me off to sending cases to Veterans Court, but I'm still open to doing that in an appropriate case by making sure that the time the plea is taken, that my court is aware of it, because I only found out that he had pled and had and actually allocated to violence and then got on the stand on the custody and deny that it ever happened. So those are my concerns, and that's why one family, one judge makes sense, because it would be hard to do <clears throat> if it was before the same judge if you pled guilty and then denied that you did the act. Right. But they um, are available to us, as is the drug court. Right. Are you, are you able to uh, mandate or, 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 or provide 
the same services that this veteran would get in that veterans court for all practical purposes, or? I believe the veterans court has a veteran as a judge, so there's a certain connection that the defendant may have with a veteran. There's also mentorship that, that I know we're trying to right. expand. And I know in the mental health court, Judge Demick does a wonderful job and really connects with his defendant on a different level. But we do have access to EAC Link and the other mental health programs, and the different attorneys come in and bring us you know, mental health programs that they want their clients to go to, and I'm not opposed to that as long as they're willing to sign releases and my resource coordinator can get the information directly from the program as to the defendant's attendance and whether they're benefiting from that. All right. So let's get to the, to the services that are available to defendants, families that are in um, the IDV uh, court. What, what city agencies, if any, are, are in the court or involved in the work of the, the court? In terms of services? Yeah. Um, again, the Justice Center provides social services and immigration advice. We have a battery intervention programs, drug and alcohol programs, mental health programs, parenting skills. Again, my resource coordinator has access to um, the different programs that may be um, best suited to the defendant. We get our initial request from the district attorney who has spoken to the victim and will say, in this case, I'm offering this and this plea with battery intervention, alcohol, drug treatment, et cetera, or mental health. If the complainant is saying the person has been on <clears throat> meds for years, then that's what the offer will be. We then, when we have both parties before us, we'll hear what the other side says that the other party needs. And so we can have those other services made available. Um, and if the defendant is or the respondent is seeing a private therapist and it's working for them, as long as they're willing to sign a release that the therapist will tell us the person is attending and we're addressing their issues. So those the, are the services. The resource coordinator, that's a, a, that's a OCA employee? An OCA employee who works right. for me and she's in touch with all of these programs, ACS, et cetera, who are providing information <clears throat> and keeping track of the defendant's attendance, et cetera. All right. I know the last thing I'm going to want to ask is you to explain the lack of supervised visitation and what the city could potentially do to accommodate that, but, but my, that's my ultimate question. My, my penultimate question is, um, other than that, are, are there services that you would like there to be available that are not, or are there services that there's just, there's just not enough of? So for example, Two years ago, we visited and, and had a hearing on the human trafficking court, um, and we received testimony that uh, the services that were being provided were the right services, but the service providers were overwhelmed, and um, they could not take all the, 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 the people that um, the judge, judges would like to send their way. So um, are, are the services that you think need to be available uh, available, either in scope or in, in availability? Look, if somebody has insurance, obviously it's easier for them to get into a drug and alcohol program. If they don't have insurance, it's, it's more difficult. Uh, I don't hear that there's a wait list necessarily to get into any other program, but I do hear that with the supervised visitation, where Safe Horizon, although they're in our building and they do a great job in the for the most difficult cases where we want them going through magnetometers with court offices around, so we know we're ensuring victim right, safety. So let, let's do supervised visitation. Just what is that? All right, so they come in through different parts of the building, one through Supreme Court, one through criminal court, so they never have to meet the parties. The non-custodial parent waits. The custodial parent brings the child in, meets with the um, supervisor. They have a little conversation, set it up. And uh, depending on the age of the child, they'll put out the toys and the games to get this started. The custodial parent will walk out, and the non-custodial parent will walk in, again, depending on the age of the, if it's an infant. It may be different. And they observe and will report back to the court how it went. Now, we're not lulled into thinking that the victim's perfectly safe then because we know they're being observed and we know we're going to get a report back on how that went. But it is a good indication, a start. We've had cases where a child comes in, 10, 11, will face the door, won't even look at the parent, and that'll go on for a month or two. At that point, when you come back, we'll try to see if you can do something else. Trauma counseling for the child, therapeutic visitation where the child can express how awful it is. I don't want to see that person. And then there are cases where the custodial parent may be manipulating the child, and the social workers will see that. 
We also have, and I neglected to mention, the Children's Law Center in our part, and all eligible families get a child, an attorney assigned for the child, and I get very good information through the Children's Law Center, who have social workers on their staff who can feel out whether they believe it's a uh, case where the child is being manipulated. And I'll listen to that. And and, and, and is the, the prime purpose of these supervised visits to to um, inform the court and the, the, the determinations you have to make about custody and And reuniting and the children with their non-custodial parent to have, they have rights to see their children and children need to see their parents. So the best, we can't force visitation. So there are defendants, respondents who say, I don't want to see the kid and, and I'll again put the case over and see if we can try to do something with the family member to intervene. But after that at some point, I can't force visitation, but to have visitation where a non-custodial parent is seeking that, I do everything I can to try to connect in a safe way. And there are long wait lists in some agencies for us to get into Right, that. so in terms of resources, there's not enough availability to, to do these visits in, in the time that you'd like to do them. In a safe space, correct. And they're all, they all take place at the courthouse? Only Safe Horizon is in the courthouse. The other agencies are outside the courthouse, CFS, the New York Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, and then we use private social workers where I'll pay, I'll sign a 722C again for them to get that through court funding. 722C um, is? Order that they get, um, the city and state will pay for the supervised visit. But again, that'll be for therapeutic visits for three visits. That's not really long enough, period. What, what do you have to show or what has to be shown for you to? They have to be eligible. In other words, they have to have a signed counsel. They can't afford a lawyer. We can look at their uh, tax returns in terms of uh, what they earn and whether they're eligible for that um, service. But the best way to do this would be for the agencies to have funding. We wouldn't have these long wait lists. I know in family court, their wait lists are even longer because many of these agencies give priority to the IDV cases, but we still have wait lists. Got it. All right, thank you. Um, we've been joined by Council Member Vanessa Gibson from the Bronx. Do any of my colleagues have questions? Barry was here first. You have a question? So, Barry Carlos. I think it's good afternoon. Thank you for being here today, Judge. This is uh, obviously a very important topic in our great city. Um, one of the things that concerns me uh, very much, um, I sit on the General Welfare Committee as well, and uh, we have seen um, where the number of people coming into the homeless shelter system now okay. is 30 percent domestic violence victims, which unbelievably outstrips uh, people who are getting evicted by about three to one. And I just wanted to know if you had any comments or thoughts on that. And we, we deal with that regularly, where the party's in a DV shelter or just a shelter for families, and it uproots the whole family. I mean, the schools are changed. If there's visitation ongoing, and the pickup and drop-off was from school to school, so the parties don't have to see each other, suddenly they're from Brooklyn, they're living in the Bronx. And, and it is a big problem. So it's a disaster for the family. I, I can, you know, and um, children not going to school, and their friends, their their property. It, it's it's a problem, and so we look at that. Any thoughts that you might have on how we could? I know it's almost impossible issue. Yeah, it's a funding a funding issue where uh, I would hope they would try to at least keep them in the borough unless they're changing boroughs for safety. At least keep them in the borough where the rest of the. Uh, family is and so they can continue but uprooting them has to be the worst thing for them and we deal with that pretty regularly okay thank you mr chair thank you Your Honor. uh thank you council member manchaka thank you chair and thank you judge for being with us today uh, i wanted to maybe do a little bit of focus on a population that we believe is also uh not only represented but potentially underrepresented and what we're trying to do is bring more cases out of the shadows and that's our immigrant family families and our immigrant mothers and I kind of want to hear from you your experience uh, in the last few years and the texture of that community the special uh, kind of attention or specific services training that might be administered um, more efficiencies just anecdotally, um, there may be fewer people reporting, but the wonderful thing about my part is that we have the same lawyers basically there all the time who are very well aware of the immigration issues. And I know the agency- Can you repeat that again, sir? They are aware- They are, are very well very aware, aware of the immigration okay. issues. We're talking about the victims right now. And so 
they're giving them immigration advice, the Justice Center. Um, and from when I started doing domestic violence, there was always that threat, you know, you're not legal here, your kids will be taken from you. And so we've, I've been hearing that forever. Um, I would hope that the DV officers who appear at the home treat the documented and undocumented the same, so that should not be an issue. Um, when the criminal defendant is taking a plea, we go off the record and discuss whether the plea to this specific count is going to make it a deportable offense. The DA assigned to my part is very aware of that as well. And they're very, very often willing to have them plead to a non-deportable offense once the immigration advice has come through. And we've adjourned cases for possible disposition to uh, allow the defendant to speak with immigration lawyers to see how that could be worked out. So nobody's trying to uh, not give services to those who, who need it. And other than um, being requested by the defense in terms of not taking a plea today and waiving the 3030 right to proceed immediately, we don't really discuss immigration in the part or, or someone's legal status. And the services are available, whether it's supervised visitation or the social services, and we don't make any kind of, certainly not in the courtroom, in terms of somebody's uh, eligibility for that. Um, so. How does the status question and the, the kind of um, kind of a, the hesitation to even arrive at a, at a report at a precinct level and w once the case kind of gets to you, how, how, does, how does the immigration status issue impact? I think you kind of said it, but I, I kind of want a, a more clear, clear kind of positioning. Uh, in, in, in what way does an immigration status impact the case itself? with multiple kind of con uh, concerns for the individual. All right, so when we're talking about us, uh, IDV is a compliance part, and so a defendant is on a criminal case, is directed to do a battery intervention program, and the case is put over. So it's 16 weeks, 14 weeks, and we're monitoring that. If the defendant misses a session in the um, program, my resource coordinator is going to know the next morning, and I'll have the attorney bring the defendant in, and we try to escalate the penalty. So the first time on, they may have to plead to a VOCD violating the conditions. But after that, it may be a jail sentence of even a weekend, and that can expose someone who doesn't have status if they're incarcerated and uh, ICE is doing something. So I'm aware of that. I'm aware of that, and I look at that. So and is that something that kind of goes across the system as far as training, understanding, awareness? I can't speak for the whole system. I know the defense bar. I know they've been uh, speaking about uh, doing their training on immigration. I know a lot of them have retained immigration lawyers on their staffs. Um, but it's something that I'm very well aware of, and especially if that's the custodial parent, because that person has taken where the children go. So uh, I look at all of those issues. and. Right. Uh, well, I look forward to continuing to work with you. Last week, we had a, I, had, I chaired an immigration hearing on you and T-visas and the kind of real impact a city could have and the involvement of both the legal services and our courts and our NYPD and the district attorneys in really unlocking that potential for certification. And I understand that you also have that ability. Is that right? Sure. If the uh, complaining witness has assisted in the prosecution, I've signed several of those visas where they're allowed to stay because they did assist in the... And the certification is really, and this is what I was bringing awareness to, it's not the visa, it's the next step toward the federal government doing their work to do that vetting. And the more we can just certify at the end of the day if they've cooperated in some way with some kind of information, that should be enough. That should be. And right now we're seeing a lot of denials for reasons that are could, will continue to be revealed um, and so this is just important this is a really great the start of this conversation and I'd like to continue working with you to yes. build that awareness within the whole system and really bring more justice to families at a time where this president continues to make it very difficult for people to want to come out engage in public safety in their neighborhood either to report crimes or to come out themselves if they are uh, a survivor of domestic violence in their homes, and that's what we're going to need more of. And the more immigrants we can get out seeking justice, 
the better the, your, the system will, will play out. Better for our families, I better agree. Better for our families. So thank you for your work. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Council Member Vallone. Uh, let me just mention we've been joined by Council Member uh, Andy Cohen from the Bronx. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Judge, for making it today. It's part of my DNA to stand when a judge enters the courtroom, <laughs> so it's very hard for me not to stand, but nice thank time. you for taking time. I know how hard your parts are. The, the Chair has raised these issues on almost all of these uh, ongoing hearings to determine how we can assist and how we can help, and I think being part of a practicing attorney, there's an overwhelming sometimes sadness on the delay in the courtrooms and how much is thrown onto your mantle to handle. I just wonder how is the current backlog in the domestic violence courts today as compared to maybe a few years ago? I can't speak to the lower courts. I know that my clerk in um, IDV, the family court clerks, the matrimonial clerks are looking daily at the rosters. And so if you go into family court just to file for custody or for an order of protection, your return date on proof of service could be three months. In my part, when there's an arrest and the match is made within two weeks, you'll be before the IDV court. So IDV, the fact that we're looking at all of the cases, brings the issues before the court much quicker. And our resolutions are much quicker because the victim has to be in the courtroom when her family case is on and when the matrimonial is on. So everybody has to be there on every appearance. And so that brings us much, much. Now, why, why is that not the case in the other courts that have a three-month back? So for you, that's, you're doing it for two weeks. You're getting everyone there. Why, why is that not the same? But it's overwhelmed with petitions. The matrimonial bar, I don't know if there are any matrimonial lawyers. There's a culture of delay, consent delay. And so matrimonials can be adjourned two, three months, and then again two, three months. And my part, every time the criminal case is on, the divorce is on. And so the issues are being addressed much quicker. Um, so is it part, uh, there's an under, yeah, there's part of a culture where there's sometimes, I remember being out in the hallway and the attorneys are like, hey, I, you know, I've got something going on today, can you put this off for two weeks? And, and you can see that happening. This is not one of those areas we can afford to have that happen at all. If someone's Clearly. waiting for a car accident case that's been sitting for four years, nobody cares about two weeks. But on a case with domestic violence, with immigration, with marital status, mental health awareness, criminal um, we had the district attorneys and the ADAs in here just not too few months ago saying that they had tried two cases because there's no ready courts, there's no judges, that ready part. And it's not just the judge, it's the court officers, the law secretaries, the court reporters having a courtroom available. And, and that's Thankfully, where Thankfully, we don't have that issue in terms of resources. We okay. have three Wonderful. officers, that's a, good news, a sergeant, at least. three clerks at every given time, and we don't want to say it too loudly, but... We're It'll be our We're secret for the whole city, but that's... Yeah. So that's where I think we, we as council members can always try to help, especially when we're dealing with OCA and state issues, where we, on behalf of our boroughs and our districts, can advocate for our judges and for our court officers and clerks and law secretaries to make sure the parts and the system between Queens and Bronx and Staten Island is more of a uniform following what you've done. And some of our judges have taken the lead to do that, to break that systemic barrier, so we thank you for that. If there's any other ideas, please get them to our chair. I'm still going to go back to my supervised visitation, so if we can get any funding for that, that would make a difference in my part. Without telling a respondent, you have to wait three months before you're going to see your two-year-old child, which is a lifetime to the child, certainly. That one thing alone may make the whole hearing worthwhile. Thank you very much, Judge. Right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Council Member Gibson? Thank you very much, Chair Lanceman. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Judge. It's good to see you today. Thank you for coming to City Hall. Um, I am a council rep member representing Bronx County, so I speak from a lot of experience in terms of working with all the courts. I represent uh, the entire civic area of the Bronx, family, criminal, civil, um, as well as the DA's office and the Family Justice Center are all in the district I represent. So I just had two questions just based on your experience, and I know you talked about funding being obviously a challenge in terms of needing needing more funding for the level of resources that are needed. Um, I also see another challenge for us in the city is obviously the ongoing partnership that we have to have with OCA. 
and it's not always as easy as we would like it to be um, because I don't think, you know, we always have the same conversations at the same time. Let me put it like that. Um, so what I'd like to understand, and I um, have a high number of domestic incidents, particularly in public housing in the Bronx. Um, I get reports, so I know my domestic incident reports. I have thousands every single year. And as Councilmember Gradenchik said, you know, a lot of those families obviously are in the shelter, but many of them are living their daily lives, and they're living in a domestic incident. Some may not even know. So I'd like to understand further from your perspective, what can we do as a council to make sure that there is a, a better coordination of services. So the Family Justice Centers really serve for me as an anchor of making sure that we deal with the health care, the housing, the emergency transfers, the access to benefits and food, um, getting school children moved through the system, which I think is great. Um, I'm always looking at ways that we can improve because I think in light of what Councilmember Menchaca has said with the immigration issue that, you know, lingers over our head, but it's a real reality for many families, how can we find ways to make sure there's a better coordination of services, but also how can we be more creative in bringing many victims out? Um, many of them are fearful. They don't like to talk to government. They don't like to go to buildings with metal detectors. They don't like to sign in and do intake. I mean, it's a real challenge. And we've noticed, you know, since this administration that some are not going to medical appointments. They're not going to the health care centers. They may or not be sending their children to school. It's a lot of things that we've seen just on the ground. So I'd like to get an understanding. We're about to approach a new budget season in January. Um, what you think we can do to make sure that there's a better coordination of services. Obviously, working with OCA, I don't forget about that critical partner because we need their support. Um, I used to be, as, as well as Councilmember Lanceman, we both served as assembly members, so we remember those conversations around OCA's budget um, and how we can make sure that if we are bringing in more judges, we also bring in more support staff as well, right? You can't bring in more judges without support staff, but sometimes that happens. So just from your perspective, as a sitting judge, what do you think we can do to make the system better? All right. uh, we do have a statewide coordinating judge for family violence. I'm sure you know her, Judge Deborah Kaplan, <clears throat> and she's dealing with a lot of these issues statewide and certainly focuses on uh, the city of New York. <clears throat> and um, you know, she travels throughout the states and really advocates for problem-solving courts to deal with a lot of these issues. What I try to do in our stakeholder meetings is to bring as many people to the table as possible. So we had a meeting where NYCHA was present, and we raised the issue of living in a NYCHA building and the leases in the defendant's yep. name, abuses, right. and NYCHA was right there on top of it, and they will move the complaining witness to another NYCHA apartment away from that, and that was their promise to us. And I haven't heard any complaints since then, so I know they're doing what they can to ensure that their victim is moved and they're not evicted from that home, although the lease is not theirs. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> other than that, bringing people to the table and telling us what their issues are, from where I sit, I'm not really involved in any budget issues in terms of bringing services. It's just being sensitive to the people who come before the court and, uh, and dealing with the families that are before me. Okay. I think we've had a number of conversations and I've been privy to them. I'm a part of the mayor's uh, domestic violence uh, working group and I've had meetings with them. Mark J knows uh, very much. And, you know, we have to reduce the burden of this bureaucracy. There's a lot of red tape we have to cut through. The level of paperwork that sometimes is involved, even with NYCHA and fulfilling a safety transfer, sometimes it gets challenging because if we're talking about a victim fleeing from, you know, his or her home, they don't necessarily concern themselves with paperwork all the time. And the state has done an incredible amount of work on legislation that has been adopted that will protect their identities and make sure that victims are able to survive um, and, and, you know, fulfill transfers and social services and other things that are needed. And I've been a part of that, and I'm very grateful for that, where you can get an order of protection. It could be online now, so you don't have to go into a police precinct. So things like that, I feel like, are great 
great and they're a part of the overall conversation to make it better. I certainly don't want us to do anything to double victimize a victim. We want to make it as easy as possible as we can. So I appreciate the input and certainly know that we have a lot more to do. Um, can you provide any insight for me personally on what the Bronx IDV looks like, the domestic violence court? Because I, I have never visited and I probably should take a visit. You should take a visit, okay. but I, it works basically the same way in terms of transfer of cases. Right. So I don't know their volume and I don't know in terms of okay. services that are available, but uh, I believe it, uh, it works the same way. And just to mention the confidentiality issue, we're very, very aware of that in our IDV court. Mm -hmm. We'll mark the file confidential, and right. so the victim's address will not be released and any information once she's or he is seeking confidentiality. So that okay. goes a long way in once the transfer is done, keeping the new address Absolutely. confidential. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank right. you, Chair. Who's next? <laughs> Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Judge, thanks so much. We really appreciate your, your coming here. We're always very grateful when OCA uh, sends a representative to testify, and uh, it goes Thank without you. saying, we're all big fans of the work that you do, and Thank we're going to be looking to figure out ways that we can support that work. Thank you, Thank you so much. Okay. So next, we're going to hear from the administration, um, which I understand is the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. So come on down. Good. You raise your right hand. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Terrific. Um, let's put 10 minutes on the clock for, for each. Um, but, oh, you're the only one testifying? Terrific. Um, and uh, extra points for not using the whole 10 minutes. But no it's problem. there for you if you need it. <laughs> no problem. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, Chairperson Lansman and members of the City Council Committee on Courts and Legal Services. I'm Elizabeth Dank, Deputy Commissioner and General Counsel at the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence, and I'm joined by my colleague, Nicole Torres, at the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today about the City's Integrated Domestic Violence Courts. Um, the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence was established in 2001 and oversees the citywide delivery of domestic violence services, creates innovative policies, um, develops crisis intervention and prevention-based programs, and works to increase awareness through broad and diverse outreach efforts throughout New York City. OCDV also operates the city's five family justice centers, which provide holistic, multidisciplinary, and trauma-informed services for victims of intimate partner violence, sex trafficking, and elder abuse in one location. Um, the services at the family justice centers are provided by over 40 community-based organizations who are on-site at the centers, as well as other city agencies, including the district attorney's office, the New York City Police Department, and the Human Resources Administration. In 2016, the FJCs had over 62,000 client visits across the boroughs, and over 10,600 of those clients were involved in an open criminal case. Many, if not the majority of those cases, would have been pending in the city's domestic violence or integrated domestic violence courts. As Judge, Judge Morgenstern um, already testified about, um, the domestic violence courts have dedicated judges that provide over a domestic violence-related criminal case from post arraignment to disposition, and the IDV courts are a one-judge, one-family model where a single judge has the authority to hear domestic violence related criminal family and matrimonial cases that are related to the same petitioner complainant, complainant and respondent defendant. The family justice centers are closely connected to the DV and IDV courts and court staff as appropriate are able to provide referrals for victims to the FJCs and create linkages to resources. In addition, more broadly, we've been working closely with the Office of Court Administration to enhance court engagement and responses to domestic violence system wide. Last year, the mayor launched the New York City Domestic Violence Task Force, which was co-chaired by the First Lady, um, Shirley McRae, and Police Commissioner O'Neill, and co-led by OCDV and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, Mock J. The Domestic Violence Task Force held working group meetings over the course of a month to develop 27 recommendations, which were funded and released earlier this year. OCA played a significant role in the task force. The Honorable Deborah Kaplan, statewide coordinating judge for family violence cases, was a co-chair of one of the working groups that specifically looked at long-term violence reduction. In addition, the task force convened subcommittees to further explore family court and criminal court-related issues with the courts and other key stakeholders. 
Several of the recommendations of the task force either directly or indirectly impact the court systems and will be coordinating in vary, varying degrees with the courts for implementation plans. For example, expanding the early victim engagement program to the Bronx and Staten Island will enhance victim engagement at the time of an abusive partner's arraignment to provide critical information about the outcome of the arraignment, including bail and order protection status, and create strong linkages to services and resources to promote safety. Also, creating domestic violence programming within the Department of Probation through a pilot program in the Queens Domestic Violence Court will allow the courts, probation, prosecutors, and defense attorneys to more effectively utilize probation as a tool in risk assessment, accountability, and linkages to trauma-informed services for abusive partners. And finally, the city contract for abusive partner intervention programs, which are for court-mandated criminal justice-involved offenders, will soon require that the programming be trauma-informed and culturally specific to ensure that criminal justice-involved offenders are attending a program that is using evidence-informed treatment modalities. Programming will also be expanded to include Staten Island. The task force will have ongoing engagement with key stakeholders, including the courts, to implement the current recommendations and develop durable and effective solutions to domestic violence citywide. We look forward to continuing our work with the city, the courts, community partners, and the council on our shared goal of raising awareness about domestic violence and enhancing resources and innovative programs and models throughout the city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so you, you, you heard um, the judge's testimony. Do you have anything to, to, to add or any insight into the problems that the court is having with scheduling these uh, supervised visitations? Mm -hmm. and, and what is the city funding for that, if, if any? Mm -hmm. so, um, so the supervised visitation um, issue has been brought up through the task force working groups and is an issue that the task force is continuing to explore. Um, currently, MACJ and OCDV um, have partnered with Safe Horizon on a federal grant for supervised visitation in Queens. So that project is currently operating now. Um, and I know that there are several other um, programs operating in the city through Safe Horizon and other community-based organizations. But we agree that this is something that needs uh, additional resources. And so we're looking at that matter through the task force currently. One of the questions I raised with, with the judge was whether or not it made sense that seemingly the more serious the offense, assuming it's a domestic violence offense, if, and if it's a felony, the less likely it is that the, um, the, the victims will benefit from the one judge, one family uh, uh, policy of, of the integrated domestic violence court. Do, do you see in the family justice centers where uh, victims of, of domestic violence are, are, are coming and, and you know, if they only had qualified to be in an IDV court, their lives would have been a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So I can say that the resources available at the Family Justice Centers are available regardless of whether there's criminal case, criminal involvement, or the level of the criminal offense. And so um, our services are available for any of the clients that we see regardless of um, but it's, but what's it's, happening in the criminal I understand, case. But it's got to complicate the handling of a matter for uh, a lawyer or, or someone offering advocacy services mm -hmm. if the case is, is being heard in different courts as opposed to, or the, the problem is being heard in different courts as opposed to, to, to one court. I, I guess I'm asking your, your opinion, the administration's opinion as to whether or not advocating for and fighting for uh, um, uh, more serious cases, the felony cases, to also be treated in, in, to be heard in the IDV parts is, is, is worthwhile. Because mm -hmm. we have to pick and choose events what we're going to try to do to improve the courts and support the courts. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that the um, key is ensuring that there are linkages to those resources and services, um, regardless of which court part um, cases are heard. And so we work very hard to engage OCA and our partners throughout the court system, but in addition, um, the district attorney's offices um, and other community partners to ensure that those resources are available and that clients and victims of domestic violence are made aware of those resources and can access them easily. Mm -hmm. um, all right, do any of my colleagues have uh, any questions? Oh, uh, Councilmember Gornetchik, let me just mention that Councilmember Ben Kalos from Manhattan 
has joined us. Go ahead, Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good, good afternoon. I want to uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, my previous life at Queensborough Hall, I had occasion to supervise the person who uh, oversaw the Borough President's domestic violent work, and we, uh, we work very closely with the Family Justice Center there, and they're really uh, wonderful, wonderful people, and they do an outstanding job. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you a question about uh, homeless services and how closely you work with with the um, Department of Homeless Services, and can you explain that about a little little bit about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, our office works closely with the Department of Homeless Services with DHS. Um, currently, right now, we've been working closely around training. Um, earlier this year, or sorry, earlier last year, our office launched a policy and training institute um, to be able to enhance the training that is happening um, with city employees about the complexities of domestic violence, um, including linkages to resources and access to information. Um, so we've been working closely with DHS to provide trainings across the shelter staff, both um, DHS employees and contractor providers. Um, I don't have the current numbers um, on me, but I know that we've reached a significant number um, and are still continuing um, ongoing conversations with DHS around training and how to continue to enhance those efforts. Um, DHS also was part of the task force, um, and so um, one of the task force recommendations was to continue to explore housing and procedural mechanisms to enhance um, safety for victims around housing. So it's something that we are continuing conversations about and um, is definitely a priority of the task force to continue to explore. It concerns all of us greatly because um, upwards of 20,000 of the people in the shelter system mm -hmm. are DV victims uh, or the children of DV victims. So it's, it's something that we need to focus on um, greatly. Um, can I ask you what you think the biggest problem f facing your agency or in dealing with the victims of domestic violence? Um, okay. Sure. So I think um, one of the um, one of the great things about the task force, which was just convened, is the fact that it is a partnership between our two agencies, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and OCDB, because it marries the criminal justice and social services solutions and approaches in a way that we hadn't formalized them before. Of course, our agencies have been partnering together for many, many years, but the task force um, created this more formal approach to be able to look at the issue from both the criminal justice and the social service lens and develop solutions that address it from both angles. Thank you. I've been working on this issue since college, and it just mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to get better. I mean, we we're, maybe we're a little better at handling it, but that's been a long time. But I want to thank you for your work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time. Thank you. Member Kalos. Thank you for the uh, thank you to the chair for this hearing on this important issue, Rory Lansman, and thank you to the uh, mayor's office uh, to combat domestic violence. So, in your testimony, you indicated that uh, there were m more homeless families with children uh, who found themselves in that situation because of domestic violence versus uh, evictions, which is a first time, but a uh, very sad fact to learn. What types of resources are available in terms of vouchers or other resources through the courts or through your office to help victims of domestic violence find housing immediately and what's their average stay in the sh system in the shelter system sure so i don't so i didn't talk about that in um in my testimony but i can definitely address Sorry, um, that's, that's in okay. the that's in the committee report oh that's fine i can definitely it's address um, the online. housing um, so um, right, before, right at the time the task force was launched, um, we received um, funding um, through the city to be able to bring housing legal services on site to the family justice centers. Um, so we um, launched housing legal services on site um, uh, in partnership with the Human Resources Administration and the Office of Civil Justice Coordinator's Office um, earlier, or sorry, at the end of last year. And one of the recommendations of the task force that was released earlier this year was to continue those services on site. So those services are remaining. Um, so we are um, pleased that we'll be able to add that to the holistic services that we're offering on site at the Family Justice Centers. With regard to uh early victim engagement I think once folks are at the courts that's a, a good step and it means they've made it through a lot of places where they might have often been deferred mm -hmm. uh, 
has the Mayor's Office of Com to Combat Domestic Violence had any interaction with the NYPD and how they treat uh, domestic violence complaints, mm -hmm. 911 calls, or even just harassment complaints, where I would say that quite often in certain cases and anecdotal stories I've heard from constituents, uh, harassment complaints aren't necessarily taken as seriously until something bad has happened and what that bad has happened uh, is often far beyond what's required for the legal definition of harassment. Mm -hmm. So yeah. are you tracking harassment and through 911 calls and what the responses are and how can we make sure that we take um, domestic violence at every level, uh, even when it's at the harassment level seriously and make sure people have the resources they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we work closely with the NYPD and specifically the Domestic Violence Unit. We have domestic violence prevention officers on site at each of the five family justice centers to provide opportunities for victims to have that level of engagement with NYPD, but also to be able to file police reports on site at the FJC. We also work closely with the NYPD around tra training, specifically trauma-informed approaches to um, engagement with domestic violence victims. Um, and specifically to address um, the question about harassment, um, my office had launched a coordinated approach to preventing stalking program in Staten Island several years ago in collaboration with the Staten Island District Attorney's Office and the NYPD, and it was, launched, it was expanded to Queens um, about two years ago, and one of the task force recommendations is to expand it further. Um, and that program specifically looks at uh, complaints for harassment and recognizing those cases early on as um, early indicators potentially of stalking incidents um, and how to increase um, awareness um, and understanding and law enforcement efforts around stalking. So is there a new management report or some sort of report that you're using to track how many harassment complaints are getting there and how many folks are being turned away from precincts? I guess the concern being that I feel that our precincts can sometimes, uh, while they're dealing with gun violence or other priorities, that mm -hmm. the, the harassment complaints folks can come try to file a complaint and often they may give a warning or not necessarily invoke the formal process and then mm -hmm. you end up with folks not getting the support they need and um, is there a way to make sure that informational pamphlets are provided or something to make sure that there's some sort of compelled speech so that if somebody makes the complaint they get the support and services they need immediately versus once there's been a, uh, a repeated incident. Mm -hmm. So we work closely with the Domestic Violence Unit, which has the Domestic Violence Prevention Offices in each of the precincts um, to ensure that they have information and access to resources. Um, there was also recently um, a city-funded program through NYPD um, to Safe Horizon to provide crime victim, it's called the Crime Victims Assistance Program, CVAP, um, that houses um, advocates in every precinct, and one of those advocates will specifically be a domestic violence advocate, and so um, that's another um, avenue or entry point to services as well. Thank you, and just please take the harassment as seriously as possible and get NYPD to make sure that every harassment complaint is properly investigated and prosecuted. Thank you. Council Member Gibson, anything? Good. All right, thank you so much. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Okay, um, next we're going to hear from, uh, other than Sanctuary, are there any service providers that are here to testify? Any direct service providers other than Sanctuary for Families? Okay, so why don't we call up the legal services providers and Sanctuary in one panel? And that would be Sanctuary for Families, um, New York County Defender Services, Bronx Defenders, Brooklyn Defenders, We've got two Brooklyn defenders. Come on down.
All right. Good afternoon. You raise your right hand. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Terrific. Um, welcome, and uh, whatever order makes sense to all of you. You've got five minutes, use them however you want. But uh, it is the only opportunity that we actually get to hear from the child in any form. Um, in Manhattan... Let, let me just interrupt to, to understand. So primarily, you would be representing the defendant. Yes. The criminal right. defendant in the DV charge. Exactly. Got it. Um, we have two agencies that we kind of use in Manhattan actually three. It was CFS, which we don't use very often now, NYSPCC, uh, the New York Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, and we also have a community organization, which we're now relying on uh, a lot, Treat Me Right. It is a church-based um, organization with volunteers that um, do the visitation. What's missing from that church base is the fact that the individual counselors are not social workers. So if we think that there's a real problem uh, that needs to be worked out between the parent and child, uh, we'd rather have a certified social worker looking at the response. The person who uh, supervises the visitation at Treat Me Right is a social worker, but the people that actually do the one-on-one -on -one with the parent and the child are uh, volunteers from the church community. What's good about the church is it is in the community. It's at, in um, the 160s on the west side, uh, and clients kind of feel comfortable at that setting. Uh, we don't have, I mean, if your client can't afford to pay for the uh, supervised visits, we're stuck with one hour worth of visits. Uh, it's disappointing for the child. If the child is very young, it doesn't provide for continuity. Uh, and sometimes we've had wait periods as long as seven or eight months. Uh, it significantly holds back what we can do in terms of visitation if there are questions about safety of the parent with the child. So we are really asking for more creative ways. The church was a creative way to sort of open up the amount of visitation that we could do. So not only could the, super, the visits be supervised one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes we have what we call supervised exchanges. The parent takes the child, uh, picks the child up at the agency. Uh, they do an assessment of the child and the parent before the visit starts. They do the visit. They return to the agency. They do a debrief after the visit and then they report on what they're seeing so that we can monitor whether or not uh, there are any issues with visitation because the idea is eventually to have the parent take the child on their own, uh, whether it's for day visits alone, but uh, potentially for overnight visits. And it's what we kind of use as an assessment for whether or not um, regular visitation can occur. And because the child is being observed, we have some idea, or at least the court has some idea, about how the child is progressing in the visits. Um, when there's a social worker present, they actually coach the parent 
give them advice about what to do, how to answer questions that the child might have, um, how to actually even mend the parent, the parent role because sometimes it's severed, sometimes the children are angry, um, they've seen things or they, they're hostile to the parent and they do uh, help them integrate with the child. So it's, it's almost, it's our last or our first source of trying to re re repair families that are broken. And um, we just need more services. If people have money, they can pay. They can pay for the social workers themselves. They can do a whole lot of other things. They can also have more time. Okay. Thank um, you. And that's important. Um, one of the issues. Well, I, sorry, let's just go down the line oh, and then that. we can talk afterwards. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Daniel Kay. I'm a staff attorney at the Bronx Defenders, and I am our office's coordinator for the integrated domestic violence part known as IDV. Now, at first glance, you might think that IDV would be a dream for the Bronx defenders. Criminal courts are generally ill-equipped to deal with the diverse challenges that domestic violence cases pose for our clients, complainants, parents, and children. Full orders of protection and the threat of incarceration for a parent can only make matters worse for families in crisis. IDV could therefore be a real opportunity for a criminal court to holistically engage with our clients as parents and partners, as members of families, instead of just as criminal defendants. Instead of this dream, IDV can actually be a nightmare for our clients. And frequently, the limitations of the criminal justice system itself can undermine the very aims of IDV. First, engaging with both criminal court and family court services available through IDV costs money. You've heard about this before uh, earlier today. Although the court does have discretion to temporarily waive fees, different providers have different rules that can limit a court's power to do so. And this is not just a supervised visitation issue. Uh, there have been times in IDV when prosecutors or opposing counsel or the judge are describing a program, and my indigent clients have leaned over while these other uh, players are on the record to whisper to me, I want to do that, but how am I going to pay for it? Batteries intervention programs can cost hundreds of dollars over the course of several months. Now, despite 722C waivers and sliding scales, these only go so far for so long. The affordability of restorative justice should never be a factor where both liberty and the, quote, best interests of the child are at stake. The council should work to ensure that, there, that money is not a barrier to justice and IDV and that all programs are free of charge. More broadly, though, the inherent limitations of the criminal justice system often undermine meaningful resolutions for everyone involved in a case. The cases and relationships we see in IDV are complicated, and many, if not most, of those cases involve children. The blunt tools of the criminal justice system and its focus on prosecution and conviction are particularly ill-suited to deal with the complex balancing act required to do justice for our clients, complainants, and their children. Moreover, the collateral consequences attendant to criminal prosecutions and convictions affect entire families and communities. Missed work, lost jobs, and the threat of deportation of a parent can wreak havoc on children's lives. When prosecution is the primary tool we bring to bear, we lose sight of these costs. Indeed, in many cases, when zealous prosecutors define success as securing a conviction, the court process often works to disempower all parties, not just criminal defendants. A client can invest time, effort, growth, and expense in court-mandated programs only to have a prosecutor's offer to resolve the criminal matter remain unchanged, undermining a resolution in, in everyone's interest. In a situation like that, there is no incentive for clients to engage with services in the family court matter until their criminal court case goes to trial. Conversely, certain basic constitutional rights to which our clients are entitled in criminal court disappear once their case is transferred to IDV. Our clients are not presumed innocent. Instead, they are presumed to be batterers and bad parents. This is not the fault of the judges in IDV. It is the reality of a courtroom where different procedures and expectations apply to the different matters sent there. For example, it is already difficult for a parent criminally charged and endangering their children to feel their innocence is presumed in a typical criminal courtroom. Now imagine when parenting skills classes are suggested by the same judge who is deciding their guilt or innocence in the criminal case. This discourages our clients from meaningfully engaging with family court services that could prevent recidivism and promote rehabilitation. We want to challenge the council to begin thinking outside the box in this very complicated area of life and law. Criminal prosecution need not be the only tool we bring to bear. 
There are cases now making their way through our criminal courts and IDV that would be better addressed outside of the criminal justice system altogether. The Council can help to lead a paradigm shift by supporting programs and appropriate cases that de-emphasize the dominant role of prosecutors and actually focus on making families stronger. Without new and creative thinking, IDV will be a failed experiment. Having one's case heard there will be just like any other criminal court or family court, but worse. Worse for our clients, worse for complainants, worse for parents, and worse for children. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Jamie Burke. I'm a supervising attorney with Brooklyn Defender Services and I provide specialized representation to our clients in the Kings County Integrated Domestic Violence Court part. Um, the IDB Court is an innovative model, you know, you know that, but there are some things that I'd like to address about that model in particular. Um, one of the things is that the majority of cases heard in the IDB Court generally have a better outcome than in the regular DB parts. And for that particular reason, um, one of your concerns was why aren't the more serious felony cases heard in IDV? And that should happen because there are better outcomes, because there are more resources for particular cases like that. And I find in my practice that more women are charged with felony um, DV cases than men because women oftentimes will use a weapon versus a man using a weapon, which elevates that case status to a felony versus a misdemeanor. And if that case gets put out of IDV and there's a battle over conflict over custody of the children, that woman does not get and, the benefit and when of you IDV. Say, when you say better outcome, you don't mean just for the whole family, there may be that, but also a better outcome for the defendant in his or her criminal charge. Right, I mean right. holistically, and also in the criminal right. charge in particular. So yes to your question. Um, so although the intent of the IDV model is to streamline and speed up the court process, um, there are many court delays and they're difficult to obtain services that prevents that from happening. And everyone has uh, alluded to that problem, the problem of supervised visitation. There's a delay in getting a case transferred from criminal court to the Integrated Domestic Violence Court. And in that time between criminal court and IDV, there's a full stay away order so that our client is not um, given the opportunity to interact with their children. It may be the children that this person walks to school every day. It may be the children that this person cooks dinner for every day or does homework it, with every is day. Is the delay in transferring from criminal court, plain vanilla criminal court to an IDV court because of the lack of a uh, 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 supervised visitation, or that's just the bureaucracy of the, 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 the courts? It's the bureaucracy of the courts. The supervised visitation does not happen until the case gets to IDV. So if a, if a case languishes in, in criminal court for six to eight weeks, that's two months that a client has not seen their children. Then the case gets transferred to IDV, the court wants to do an investigation and so forth, and then order supervised visits, even though there's the presumed innocence, um, but there still will be supervised visits. There's a waiting list, three, four, even up to six months long for this person to get supervised visits. So two months plus six months, it could be up to eight months before a parent can have a one hour visit with their child that is supervised by a social worker. And it's unfair to the defendant who is presumed innocent in this entire process. Um, one of the other issues is, one of the other services that is needed is counseling for the parties. Oftentimes there is a separation between the parties, but I would say maybe 40% of the time, the parties are reuni reunited even after this domestic violence case is ended. Either the case is dismissed or there's a plea to a violation and there's a limited order issued so that the parties can reunite. Um, reunite. There should be counseling or co-counseling between both parents so, to learn how to co-parent in separate homes, to co-parent um, even if they're going to be reunited together. Those services are not offered. That's a resource that could, that the IDB court could use. Once the parties are separated, that's it. They'll continue in their separate therapies, but they're not working together to co-parent. 
so the children are the collateral consequences of such a decision. And those are some of the resources that the, the court could use. Um, I guess that's it for now. You may have questions later. Thank you. Good afternoon. My Good. name is Thank you. Uh, my name is Lindsay Wallace, and I'm a civil legal attorney with Sanctuary for Families, New York State's largest nonprofit organization dedicated exclusively to services and advocacy on behalf of victims of domestic violence and sex trafficking. Uh, we're very grateful to the council and Councilmember Lanceman for the opportunity to testify today. Sanctuary Center for Battered Women's Legal Services is the largest dedicated provider of legal services for victims of domestic violence in the United States. And since the inception of the Integrated Domestic Violence Courts, uh, IDVs, in 2003, our attorneys have observed the positive effects of bringing together family court, matrimonial, and criminal matters concerning the same family before a single judge. The one family, one judge model principle of the IDVs is of critical importance to victims of domestic violence. And although there were initial concerns that this model would confuse litigants, our experience at Sanctuary has been that the consolidated model increases awareness of the criminal proceedings among victims who are complaining witnesses. In the past, victims frequently lost touch with the um, assigned district attorney's offices and did not often understand what was happening in the criminal cases, and the advent of the IDVs has addressed this problem. However, the success or failure of the IDVs hinges upon the caliber of the presiding judge. IDV judges must have a high level of motivation to make a difference in the lives of families affected by domestic violence. They must possess a deep interdisciplinary understanding of the dynamics of DV and be knowledgeable about this complex and evolving area of law that encompasses multiple practice areas. Therefore, the court system should undertake an unbiased assessment of how well the judges in each of the IDVs are embodying these key leadership qualities. While the IDVs have unquestionably had a positive impact upon the administration of justice in domestic violence cases, there are several challenges that should be addressed in order to help these specialized courts reach their full potential. First, many cases that would benefit from being handled in the IDVs are not being transferred there, and decisions regarding which cases are transferred sometimes appears ad hoc. A more consistent system for identifying cases that are appropriate for the IDVs is necessary. Advocates frequently need to alert clerks in the IDVs about cases that should be transferred because the court system is not automatically identifying them. It's sometimes hard to track down who should be contacted in order to transfer these cases as well. Uh, the Brooklyn IDV, which you heard a little bit about with Judge Morgenstern's testimony, has been a nationally recognized model with a large docket in which the various stakeholders work well together. However, the recent reduction from two IDV parts in Brooklyn uh, to a single part this past year has necessarily reduced the number of cases that can benefit from being heard in this part. Consequently, cases in which the litigants do not have children have been excluded, causing a whole category of victims who were previously being served to lose the benefits of the IDV. And some IDV parts throughout the city, particularly those that operate only on a part-time basis, do not have the capacity to handle repeat cases with the same litigants. And if the IDVs are not able to hear these new actions filed by abusers to harass their victims or filed by victims as a result of continued abusive behavior and violation of court orders, victims might be re-traumatized by having to provide their entire history to a series of new judges. Second, to echo a lot of the testimony that's come today, um, one of the strengths of the IDVs is their recognition of the need for specialized integrated services for families experiencing DV. However, many of the critical services IDV judges wish to order are not available or there are lengthy waiting lists. And one example of that is, of course, supervised visitation, which I believe multiple people have mentioned at this point. Lack of free or low-cost supervised visitation resources endangers both children and their parents. So I, are, I, we yes. get the super, lack of supervised, but are there other services? Because I had to ask the judge that. That's what you wanted to talk about? Yeah, when, actually one of the things that I'm, I think that we need to do is have more access to forensics, for evaluations. We're not just talking about sometimes parents are not only substance abusers, but they have mental illness, but they also have mental disabilities. And what you can do or what is open to the parent with those other issues is also limited and we don't have enough coordination. So if I have my, a, a mentally impaired some person who actually could get services from the state, it's very hard for us to actually get them proactive in the part or to actually get our client to get the services that they're entitled to mm -hmm. and to have it actually happen. 
I also wanted to talk a little bit about that inverse um, client. We aren't getting the more serious case. Well, we well I'll get back to you on that. I, I, I just interrupted her testimony, so we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Sure. We would, we would agree there are. There's a lack of information about offender accountability programs, which programs are available, or even the, the lack of empirical evidence into the program. So I think additional information about programs being available and empirical support for whether or not those programs are actually efficient in you know, increase or decreasing recidivism um, would be an important addition as well. Um, we'd also note that some IDVs do not have adequate, if I may finish, um, do not have adequate physical space to address the safety needs of the litigants in domestic violence cases. Sanctuary has observed incidents in more than one borough in which violations of orders of protection occur just outside the court buildings. I personally had a case last week that it occurred right outside of the courtroom um, with multiple uh, people harassing uh, the client. At least one of these re resulted in an arrest. And at times, the atmosphere within the IDV court itself can be charged with aggressive, potentially volatile energy, as many accused perpetrators are in the courtroom along with victims. Sometimes victims have to testify in front of a packed courtroom of people waiting for their cases, particularly, um, I understand, in, in Kings with the increased capacity due to the downgrading from two to one judge. That's often a problem that we um, that we see, and victims who have experienced significant trauma uh, may be triggered by such a court environment and are sometimes forced to testify in front of full rooms of individuals or even just have their cases heard. Um, so this is, a, this is an issue as well in terms of capacity. Um, also, integrated domestic violence courts often lack access to child care centers that are available to litigants in family court, and uh, because they're located in the criminal courts and physically they're not always next to the family courts, their litigants may not, who need child care may not have access to the family court child care services, um, and it may be difficult for them to go back and forth between the checkpoints to get from the courtroom to the, to the child care as well. Uh, New York City and state have been pioneers in the creation of these IDVs, ensuring that the most vulnerable survivors of domestic violence have an integrated form for handling all of their cases. We believe they're truly a life-saving resource, and if following just these, uh, these few um, additions and changes would, would really improve the outcomes for all involved. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so is there anyone who has something more to add that got cut off because of the time limit? Very briefly, there's got resources. Um, there, there are not just lacking in um, supervised visitation, but as she stated, mental health resources. I, I had a client sit at on Rikers Island for uh, almost a year trying to find a mental health program for him that was suitable. And it shouldn't take that long to find a mental health program for someone, who, not just mental health program, but also um, therapeutic programs for people. It is diff very difficult to find therapeutic programs. Um, language specific therapeutic programs are also difficult to find because we have a lot of um, litigants and defendants who do, English is not their first language. And trying to find parenting skills in different languages or even therapeutic um, um, resources in different languages is difficult at best. And you know, money is always a problem. Our clients can't always afford to pay. And if they're not insured, that makes it even longer trying to find a program that is acceptable to them. So if, they, if they're uninsured and undocumented and um, speak a different language, it is almost impossible to find resources for them. Yeah, we often have, if our clients have insurance, we have some options because sometimes the uh, court will allow for uh, us to get a, just a psychiatrist to work one-on-one -on -one with the client. Um, we provide the, the psychiatrist with a protocol of things they should cover. But if the client has no insurance, uh, we are really stuck. We're down to very few programs that actually, actually take people. Um, we haven't had good coordination with, in, at least in Manhattan, with um, the veterans um, court. I did have a couple of vets. They were kind of resistant to um, going to the veterans court, but I felt that it would have been good for them because they also had trauma. Um, I think the court is opposed because there's a, there's a proto protocol for not to have joint family counseling, so everybody has to do their individual counseling, but I think that there should be some notion of how, since the family is going to work later on, even outside the court, for how um, the parties will be able to uh, communicate with each other and to prevent future 
problems of um, domestic violence that come with communication and how they deal with each other. And I think we've been, we're, we're just missing the boat on how to use counseling effectively. Uh, it, sometimes even the, the parent can't be integrated into the child's therapy, which is important in order to address whatever kind of trauma the child might feel about their parent if they witness the, domestic violence. So I think we have to re-look at that and provide uh, psychiatric, social work, whatever, counseling for the entire family. So, you know, our experience as, as a policy body, not my own experience as a lawyer, but as a policy body is, is, is uh, the Human Trafficking Court, Veterans Court, Drug Court, um, where the model is getting defendant services that he or she needs rather than treating the situation they're in strictly a criminal matter, right? So the Human Trafficking Court, many of the women are either victims of trafficking as we understand it, or regardless, they're trapped in a life that they don't really want to, want to be in. And so the court provides or orders services like uh, uh, educational services or immigration services or uh, um, counseling, uh, English language. The, the, the IDV court, it's, it's, it seems different. It's not, it's not quite that. It's really, oh. it's really not about the services that are provided either to the defendant or the family. It's, it's simply, albeit importantly, about one judge, one family, about having just consolidating and the more efficient and seamless operation of, or adjudication of, of the legal problems this family is having, some criminal, some, some civil. And, you know, what we're interested in is whether or not there ought to be more of the resources, services that are familiar to the trafficking court and the other um, uh, service courts. And you know what I'm hearing is, if there is a is a is a ability of the city to put in resources into the IDV courts, they're probably best put towards the um, supervised visitation before you get to all these other gee whiz services because because we're talking <laughs> we're not talking about a lot of money that that might be available I, may I? Yeah. I I don't think it just means putting it towards supervised visitation but oftentimes that is the foremost thought in our clients minds when will I see my children so to them even getting supervised visits. They don't want supervised. They want unfettered access to their children. But because the courts impose supervised visitation, anytime there's a DV issue, they, they almost, I would say 75% of the time, impose supervised visitation. So that's the norm in that courtroom. Other than supervised visitation, what kind, and, and it's not even accurate to describe that as a service, but other, other than supervised visitation, what other non-judicial services are are ordered or directed in the IDV courts that you see? As it is it routine for a judge to send someone to mental health counseling? Is if a judge thinks someone needs, you know, some kind of program to get their GED? Like these are the kinds of things that we see in the other courts. We're not, you don't really see that in IDV. Oh. And we probably should. Drug hmm. treatment, alcohol treatment, yes. Yes. Um, Therapy, yes, but other resources like getting a GED or going to any type of trade school or anything like that, those things do not happen, or, or um, English language does not happen. Um, there, our clients are often ordered to parenting skills classes. Yeah, that um, sort of thing. Yeah, that happens. Parenting skills classes, but there needs to be more resources for those. They, some of them need to be... Um, language specific, um, there are cultural issues that, that sometimes have to be involved. Um, well, I think we would be really interested in hearing from you, you know, after today's hearing, if you either individually or you want to get together as a group, with, with a, a menu, a realistic menu, of the kinds of services that, you know, if expanded, 
or offered in the first instance would be would be helpful. And 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 just thinking in the DV context, parenting skills seems like right up the right up that that alley. Do you know what I mean? As opposed to less uh, less on point services like a GED program or something. Well, quite and, frankly, and we could try to try to potentially work. advocate for that because our clients are working. We'd we'd like to make. They they Maybe. have low paid jobs. They don't. Right. They didn't get the GED. They could. They could uh, benefit from that. Though, that kind of counseling. A lot of them don't have a prior criminal record. Um, so our clients definitely can benefit from anything that would improve their reading skills, their ability to get a job. They have to pay child support, and they're motivated. Right. Well, I I think I can assure you we would appreciate very much looking at your thoughts reduced to writing both the the legal defender services and, and sanctuary representing the the, the victims um, on what additional what existing services uh, could be expanded that would be beneficial or what services that are not currently provided I think I think that we would be very interested in not reorienting but 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 growing the the vision and perspective of the IDV courts to be not just an administratively more efficient way of resolving problems, but also a more traditional uh, problem-solving court. And, and we'd love to hear what you have to say and then measure that against what's financially realistic. Yes, sir. I, I, oh, sorry. I, sorry. I, I think what I wanted to, I think, emphasize is that I think there's two different layers to why people need access to these services. I think first is the actual direct benefits they get from it. But I think there also needs to be some coordination between access to those services and outcomes in IDV. I think when IDV works the best, at least in the Bronx, is when someone is able to prophylactically engage with services and then bring whatever evidence they have of growth or success in those services to the DA. And in exchange, the DA offers an adjournment in contemplation of dismissal. What I think might, what I don't want to have happen is clients engaging with a wealth of new services, but then the DAs wheel around and say that, well, it's great for the purposes of the family and for your client that they got access to these services, but the offer is still, for example, a 240-26, which is uh, an unsealable violation, which have a wealth of immigration consequences and a wealth of employment consequences. I think that in exchange for there being access to these services, there still should be an ethic in IDV to recognize our clients succeeding in those services, or at least trying to succeed in those services. Well, I know that's the ethic in the other problem-solving yeah. courts, you know. Drug court, yeah. That's, that's kind of the deal. You do these programs, you successfully complete them, you're not going to be facing the same criminal consequences as if you didn't. I would just note that I think that domestic violence is inherently different than some of the other yeah, just problems. Move the mic over. Thank you. The, domestic violence um, is inherently different than some of the other types of issues that are dealt with by the other courts, and although I am um, no expert in the uh, IDVs, I have practiced in multiple IDVs throughout the city, and I just think that our organization's perspective is to make sure that the services that are being offered are have empirical evidence and support that they are effective and that they are actually uh, working, because we do find that some accountability programs that are sometimes thrown in yeah, do not necessarily true. have any evidence of actual accountability or in decrease in violence, and from the perspective of our clients, we're trying to decrease the violence and make sure that they're in a safe location throwing a panoply of services that may not be really well suited to actually addressing the problems. I do think it, DV is a, is a significantly, it's a totally different crime than many of other, yeah. other crimes that you may know, be in this I courts. very much would appreciate Sanctuary's uh, input on that. But I remember a couple years ago, um, we tagged on to a hearing, it may have been the Women's Committee, um, part of it was asking the question, not centrally, but part of it was asking the question, are batterer intervention programs uh, successful? And it was a very unsatisfactory answer. So, so we wouldn't want to be advocating to put money towards things that don't, that don't work. And, I and, think and DV, I don't need to say it, DV is also different politically with a lowercase p. Frankly, come to this perspective, all due respect to the, the zeal with which you represent your clients. Um, we start with we want to protect DV victims. So I think I think all of you have um, 
a lot to, to offer, and we would love to, now that we've kind of framed it a little bit and narrowed it down to what, what we might want to be looking for, would, would really look very closely at anything that you submitted to us afterwards. Anything else anybody wants to? Yeah. When I first started doing uh, the part, which I began when it opened in Manhattan, my clientele was mainly men. And, I'm, and I, the thing that's disturbing me right now is that I'm getting to the point where it's almost half and half men and women. And quite frankly, a lot of the women that I'm now representing, I feel, are DV victims. And I feel like the prosecutor's office is not at all paying attention to that. The, the only good piece of that is that then I absolutely use the justice system and try to convince them that they have the wrong person. So now we're wearing like a double hat because sometimes I am representing somebody who's been accused and then some other times I'm really feeling like my client is the victim. How did they not see that? And why are they now putting all these other people through this system, you know, designating them, you know, a you know, perpetuator of, of violence, and basically we still have to deal with what happens to this family. I, I just want to echo that. I think that it, it's definitely true in the Bronx. I feel like my own caseload is becoming more and more half and half between men and women. And I think that it also goes to show something that I was brought up at the human trafficking court hearing that you mentioned a couple of years ago when it comes to the opportunities for diversion earlier in the process. When someone gets to IDV, it is relatively late in the process in terms of someone having been accused, arrested, charged, motions filed, then removed to, moved, removed to IDV, and that is a lot of time and effort. And even though someone is arrested and not convicted, a lot of punishment that someone has already gone through until the point when someone can actually analyze whether or not someone could be the victim of domestic violence and bring that to someone's attention. So I think that in a situation like that, and the children haven't been, uh, their children might have been removed also in this process, and the children's interests are still also in limbo during this time. And so I think that this phenomenon is something that militates towards earlier diversion than what we currently have in the IDV courtroom. I, I would agree with that. To close. As, uh, to close. I would agree that, with that as well. The, and the other major issue you've touched upon is the one-third increase in homelessness because of domestic violence incidents. Um, a lot of time, entire families are displaced, and there needs to be uh, resources for that. There needs to be um, some sort of way to deal with that. You shouldn't displace an entire family, um, you remove what's could be the problem and leave the family intact or however you're going to deal with it. But it, it, it is an issue. And, and I remember um, her question was, how do you reach the people that live like in these housing projects? You, you meet them where they're at. You can't, if they're afraid to come to you, you got to go to them. Meet them where they're at with these issues, with these programs, and with these suggestions. That's it. That, if you must. Uh, no, I think a lot of the issues have already have already been addressed. Uh, so thank you for thank you for having us here to testify. Yes, thank you for having. Good, thank good. You. Thank you very much, and we await your follow up. <laughs> okay, our last and final witness is um, Kathleen Daniel, I believe, and she is testifying as a as a member of the public.
Good afternoon. Oh, that, 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 that. Sorry. Can we just all be seated? What? Good. All right. Ms. Daniel, you need to be sworn in. You raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. Um, Sergeant Arms, put five minutes on the clock. Please begin. Good afternoon, and thank you for conducting this hearing. My name is Kathleen Daniel, um, and while I am a city employee and I have uh, worked with the domestic violence work group in the mayor's office, I am appearing before you today as a survivor, um, as a working single mother of two who myself went through the IDV part in Brooklyn, um, and we were there for family, matrimonial, um, and support cases that spanned 28 months in total from 2010 to 2012. Um, and I'd like to thank the council for conducting this hearing. Real reform, I, I firmly believe in domestic violence processes, must be trauma-informed. Um, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you today. Um, I ask the council today to change your thinking about domestic violence families and the legal processes um, and challenge you to remove the word finite from your thinking and from your vocabulary entirely. Uh, many families torn apart by domestic violence are involved in some way with the court system for many years. I personally am still in and out of court, um, and I am now on eight years since I appeared for the first time in IDV in 2010. Um, in, I'm sorry, in 2009, I appeared in court, was not transferred to IDV until 2010. So I echo what uh, the agencies have said earlier, that it takes some time before we go into this process. I know other families that are in their 10th year in and out of family court. Once a family is released, uh, for lack of a better term, from the IDV part, you're left with a finite order of protection, uh, if you're fortunate, as I was, and no means to enforce any of the documents that the judge has signed. So as a result, my abuser has not complied with any aspect of uh, equitable distribution, um, violated many protection orders, rearrested, has sued me for custody multiple times, has stopped paying child support. So we have been in and out of court legitimately in family court but we are no longer one family, one judge, because we no longer have the benefits of IDV because there is not a criminal matter to anchor us back into that process. Um, and therefore, when I am in these other parts- All right. Is it the case that when the criminal matter concluded, you, you were kicked out of the IDV court, or, or years later, the, the litigation between um, you and, and whomever started anew? So in, in short, it's yes and yes. So any matter that is before, when there is a criminal matter, everything that is happening at the same time, simultaneous matrimony, uh, visitation, custody, child support, is all bound together. Once those matters are adjudicated, once there's the criminal matter is finished and anything else that was in this legal buffet, so to speak, is done, then you are released. And at, in 30 days, in some cases or less, the abuser can take you back to court for every aspect that was done in IDV. But you are, without a criminal matter, you cannot return to IDV. So you're subject to several different judges because your abuser has a right to continue to harass you through the court system and it is legal. Um, so the cycle of abuse and the process of justice do not end at the banging of the gavel. So I urge you to make the following reforms, all of which I personally volunteer to work tirelessly to help you bring about. One, families from IDV, when they are released, should be required to go to mandated mediation. Um, and there are wonderful nonprofits like the Peace Institute in Brooklyn that provide these services at no charge. Um, I don't know if they can manage the onslaught of the entire system coming to them, but there are organizations that can help you with mediation, because who then becomes the judge or the referee when these things that were decided by a judge are not done? When you have to exchange children in or out of a precinct, who decides who was late? who was on time, who's weak it really is. So mediation would assist with the co-parenting issue that we are then left to our own recourses. Um, and we cannot disregard the fact that we are dealing often with a criminal element at the least and one person who bullies or tramples the rights of the other. 
Additionally, I think that there is a very strong need to establish some integration for DV families outside of the criminal process. Uh, the abuse that I experienced psychologically, emotionally, and financially um, and, and are only escalated once the orders of protection expire and my children are constantly re-victimized every time the two of us have to exchange. So I ask you to please consider at what point do we stop protecting children from DV households and in when do we begin looking for signs of abuse in families that appear before judges and when do we stop looking for that? And, and if we continue the integration outside of a criminal process, then the families like mine that at sometimes have four and five different cases in family court can be seen as DV families in need of support. On the court system website, it says that IDV courts allow a single judge to hear the multiple case case types, criminal family and matrimonial, which relate to one family where the underlying issue is domestic violence. For far too many of us, the spectrum of abuse is not finite, and I urge you to create reforms that build a bridge from the legal processes to the practical daily lives of DV families struggling to survive trauma because the underlying issue is domestic violence. Thank you very much. Can I just ask you, when you were in the IDV court, were any services offered to you, your children, that were, were not merely, hey, we're going to have these cases heard by one judge and it will be more administratively inconvenient, you don't have to run to different courthouses, but were any services offered to you? It's a great question. I came through the Family Justice Center uh, because there was a criminal uh, case, and Beyond that, no. My children were offered the family, the children's law services, mm -hmm. but no, there was never a DV advocate offered to me. I did not know that that existed. Um, services like mediation, how to co-parent, what to do once we're released are not offered, and there's really no, no guide. And while the family justice centers are amazing, we meet them and work with these do, counselors. Do the family justice centers, did you find that the family justice centers did not have those services available to you? I think that they had amazing services, but I met them in crisis and still bruised. So it bears repeating, um, and, I, and the process doesn't necessarily allow for you to go back through. Got it. Okay. Terrific. Thank you very much, um, and you know, really respect your willingness to talk publicly about your personal situation, which I'm sure is not uh, easy. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our hearing. I want to thank all the witnesses for, uh, for their testimony, and we look forward to following up with, with them um, so that we can uh, try to have uh, some kind of impact in improving uh, how the IDV courts work and how domestic violence is treated in our justice system. Thank you all. Thank you.